Welcome to a new series here on the Wars and Rebellion channel based on my book The Civil War Battles of Macon. After rebel forces have pushed Jetson Kilpatrick's cavalry forces back around Macon, there was still uncertainty about where Sherman's army was headed. As a result, Confederate forces departed the protection of their trenches. Only 36 hours after winning in an effort to locate the enemy along the road to Gordon. Unfortunately for the soldiers, this was a terrible decision with devastating consequences. The Battle of Griswoldville. On the morning of November 22nd, Brigadier General Charles C. Walcott, part of Brigadier General Charles R. Woods, 1st Division, Major General Peter J. Osterhaus's 15th Corps, advanced towards Griswoldville to dislodge enemy cavalry that had followed Kilpatrick's withdrawing forces the night before. Similar to Kilpatrick's men the day before, Walcott's troops were instructed only to demonstrate and to avoid a major battle. Taking over the line of battle, Walcott committed the 46th Ohio, 97th and 100th Indiana, 6th Iowa, 40th and 103rd Illinois to the fight. Skirmishers, two regiments of infantry and some cavalry support struck the enemy line. Having taken the rebels by surprise, Walcott kept pushing forward and his man pursued in double quick. With cheers and laughter, the fleeing horsemen waded the creek, marched through the belt of timber beyond until they reached an open prairie-like field, which was in possession of a large rebel cavalry force. Here, Walcott paused for a moment and reformed his lines. After another brief skirmish, the rebel cavalry fled in confusion, as Wheeler's forces withdrew in various directions. Osterhaus worried that the Confederate cavalry might swing around Walcott's force to attack them in the rear. Therefore, he ordered Walcott to return to the edge of the prairie-like field and take up a defensive position. On the elevated ground, Walcott's about 1,500 men awaited the arrival of the Georgia rebel forces from Macon, which came into view around 2.30 p.m. Colonel Robert F. Catterson had taken position with his 97th Indiana at the right edge of the line, protecting the brigade's flank. He reported, we had scarcely taken position in the edge of the timbers, skirting the farm on the east when our pickets were fired upon. Taking advantage of some quickly created obstructions to cover themselves, the troops awaited the enemy onslaught. Catterson continued, The enemy was soon discovered emerging from the woods, about 800 yards from our position, and rapidly running across an open field towards us in three lines of battle, either of which more than covered our brigade's front. As attacking forces came within a hundred yards of the U.S. line, the man had to cross a deep ravine. The result was devastating as the ravine slowed down the enemy, destroyed their formation and forcing them to advance uphill against an entrenched enemy position with a broken line. Catterson wrote, The fire was so terrible that ere the rebels reached it, many of his numbers were stretched upon the plain. Even before reaching the ravine, Willison noted in his report, 
As soon as they came within range of our muskets, a most terrific fire was poured into their ranks, doing fearful execution. The ravine held the confederates up briefly and scattered their ranks, forcing them to reform their line within 45 yards of the works. The devastating fire from the US line prevented the reforming of the rebel line and forcing them to withdraw. The first rebel attack had failed. As the fighting heated up, the commander of the brigade, Brigadier General Walcott, had to leave the battlefield. A shell fragment hit his leg. Luckily, Walcott's injuries did not require an amputation, and he eventually returned to duty. Colonel Robert F. Catterson, the commander of the 97th Indiana and a veteran of the Vicksburg Campaign, replaced Walcott at the head of 2nd Brigade. Command shifted smoothly from one veteran to another. Catterson surveyed the battlefield upon assuming command and realized that the enemy concentrated for another attack on the right of the line, whereas former units of 97th Indiana 103rd Illinois and 6th Iowa had taken position. In the middle of the line, or as two pieces of artillery, was left containing the 40th Illinois, 100th Indiana and 46th Ohio, also under pressure. Catterson called for assistance from division command. The engagement was over by sunset on November 22nd. Confederate forces withdrew from the field, leaving Catterson's brigade troll of the area. Catterson ordered his skirmishers to advance. They captured 42 enemy prisoners and an additional 150 abandoned small arms. Major Wilson reported that in front of his unit there were 51 enemy killed and wounded and 83 stands of small arms captured. He explains the three Confederate assaults were as often repulsed with terrible slaughter. Of the U.S. soldiers involved, 14 had died during the fight and 42 suffered injuries. Division command eventually reported 13 killed and 79 wounded. Once the fighting had ceased at 8 p.m., the brigade received orders to move off the field and join the other brigades of the division on their way to Milledgeville. Having defeated Kilpatrick's cavalry, but still uncertain about the exact location and goal of Sherman's main body, rebel leaders in Macon decided to send their inexperienced troops away from the protection of the defenses around Macon and towards Griswoldville. In Griswoldville, these men encountered a veteran brigade of infantry, which had fought in battles like Vicksburg and Chattanooga. While often presented as the slaughter of the young teenagers and elderly men of middle Georgia, the rebel authorities bears a blame for the outcome, having sent these men in search of battle. At the same time, the Battle of Griswoldville was a small engagement in the great scheme of the war. The numerically superior rebel forces could not overcome the superior firepower experience and training of their opponents, who used the terrain to their advantage, inflicting heavy casualties. Griswoldville was an utterly futile and unnecessary engagement.